Um, welcome to the, the last uh, speaker series seminar for this academic year for the Health Law Institute. It gives me great pleasure, and I should say that I am uh, an associate professor in the Faculty of Medicine as well as a cross supporting to the law school and the new director of the Health Law Institute. Uh, my name is Matthew Ritter, for those of you whom I haven't had a chance to meet yet. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce our final speaker in the 2016-2017 academic year Health Law Institute seminar series, and that is Camille Cameron, the Dean of the Schulich School of Law. Dean Cameron brings a rich set of national and international experiences to her work as Schulich's Dean, her teaching, and indeed her scholarly research. She was, prior to arriving at Dalhousie, the Dean of Windsor Law at the University of Windsor and a professor at the University of Melbourne in Australia and a university in Hong Kong. Her work throughout has been characterized by a commitment to civil justice, using her training as a litigator in graduate studies at Cambridge University, for example, to engage in a variety of capacity building projects in several post-conflict countries in Southeast Asia. While the scope of her work and her experience is global, I imagine that what she's going to talk to us about today stems equally from her local experience as a litigator in private practice right here in Nova Scotia, where she began her career. I think the focus on litigation and class actions as regulatory tools is timely and important, particularly for those of us who regularly attend the seminar who are engaged in such an interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary field as health law and policy, where we are perhaps uh, as much interested in how the law is understood and created by a variety of actors outside of the law, as much as what the law says on the books. So it's nice to have someone, it's important to have someone perhaps talk about law in its more classic form, in court, in the context of litigation, and that, that that kind of context continues to have a powerful role in shaping health law and policy and improving social outcomes. So please join me in welcoming Dean Cameron. Uh, thanks very much, Matthew. Um, I'm going to begin by saying that I have a, some version of a cold slash flu, so you'll just excuse the uh, a bit of croaking or sniffling. I thought it was better to come and deliver with those handicaps rather than not come at all. Uh, what I will do is present, I'll go through my presentation, and I think we'll save questions and discussions for um, uh, the end, if that suits everyone. Um, so today's presentation is called Litigation as Regulation, a Tobacco Class Action Case Study. Now a title rarely remains intact from the time the promise is made some months earlier to the time you actually do the presentation. But I've decided I'm reasonably satisfied with the title, satisfied enough that I guess I won't mess with it or change it. I do, however, want to make a few comments about it. Uh, first, the question mark is there for a reason, because the question of the value of litigation to achieve regulatory aims in a public health context, or in almost any other context for that matter, is indeed a real question, with strong arguments on all sides. And how we answer the question will depend on various things, one of which is how we define regulation. Um, as I did reflect on the theme of the presentation, I thought I might have substituted policy making for regulation, but um, I think it's good as it is for now. So the second part of the title is a tobacco class action case study. Some at least of you will know that there is some significant uh, litigation going on in Quebec now, some substantial class action litigation against big tobacco. I should say here that any litigation that takes place with tobacco companies is substantial. You can't call it anything else, and perhaps substantial doesn't even capture it. Substantial because they have pockets that are deeper than deep. I will talk about that Quebec uh, class action a little later, but I'll also talk about the large amount of American tobacco litigation that preceded it. Tobacco litigation is international, not national. It's an international global story. The Canadian litigation is another development in the international tobacco litigation story. Or stated another way, the Quebec class actions are unfolding in a way that has been shaped by that litigation that preceded it, those three waves of American tobacco litigation. <coughs> uh, 
much of the discussion and debate about the role of tobacco litigation as regulation has happened, has developed in the context of that American litigation. And so starting there, making that a starting point really does uh, make sense. Um, what are some other reasons why one would choose to make this presentation or perhaps why I happen to be interested in it? Well, of course, first, the Quebec class action. Um, it's going on in our country. It draws attention to some of the issues um, that exist around uh, tobacco control. That uh, Quebec class action opens up again the broad issues regarding tobacco regulation and control and the role of litigation as a tobacco regulation strategy or as a component of such a strategy. I say again because beginning in the 1950s and running until the late 1990s there were three very intense waves of tobacco litigation in the United States and with that lit litigation the debate that I just referred to by academics and by public health advocates about the utility of litigation in that uh, tobacco control uh, story. Uh, another reason for this particular topic is my own interest and not just uh, in tobacco regulation and control but also in the utility and the effectiveness of adversarial litigation especially given the stunning power imbalances that can exist in adversarial litigation and the impact they can have on outcomes. Uh, yet another reason related to the previous one is the way tobacco companies litigate. A deep pockets, scorched earth, take no prisoners approach to litigation. One view is that they expose the worst of the adversarial system, but that's uh, uh, not a view to which everyone would agree, with which everyone would agree. We'll come back to this if we have time. The point here is that if you're a student of the litigation process, if you take interest in it, uh, you'll probably find it difficult to avoid reading, thinking, and talking about tobacco litigation and tobacco class actions as well as other types of tobacco litigation. And while I'm listing the reasons for this presentation or why I find the topic interesting, I'll mention one, one more. It's the Australian case of McCabe ver versus British American Tobacco. Uh, what a gift that case was to a student of the litigation process and one who is interested in exploring the power imbalances that exist in adversarial uh, litigation and how they play out, how the litigation process can be commandeered by deep pockets. I say a gift, but of course this was not a happy story. Tobacco litigation, it's never a happy story. The plaintiff in that case, Rolla McCabe, was in her early 50s when she commenced the proceeding. Um, this was not a class action, it was an individual claim. She had begun smoking in her early teens, I think she was around 13 or 14 when she started smoking. She was addicted and she was very sick. She died before the case finished, as often happens in these cases. One of the reasons being, of course, the sickness of the person. Another being is that they take so very, very long to go from beginning to end. Uh, as with much of tobacco litigation, you'll see this when I talk about the three waves, uh, she won a trial but the decision was overturned on appeal. Notwithstanding that there was success at trial but that the trial decision was overturned on appeal and leave to appeal to the High Court of Australia was denied, High Court of Australia being there, Supreme Court of Canada, the Court of Last Resort, um, that case did have a significant influence on the national and international discourse about tobacco litigation, tobacco control and the conduct of tobacco companies. Uh, this is a theme we will return to, that notwithstanding a negative outcome for a plaintiff, in a tobacco litigation case at the appellate level, that case might still have some regulatory and policy utility or significance. Um, and those of you, some of you I know will have read the Lynn Mather article and we'll talk about some of the things she says, but that's the point she makes, um, that if we're just going to uh, assess the efficacy of tobacco litigation by looking at appellate decisions and whether there's a win or a loss, we're missing uh, a significant part of the contribution that tobacco litigation can make to the, uh, the uh, overall control of tobacco. Um, in the Australian case, one of the aspects I was most interested in and I wrote about um, had to do with a tobacco company uh, policy which they called a document retention policy. And that the purpose of that document retention policy was to have a systematic way of destroying documents. The name, therefore, was uh, quite interesting. Uh, I focused in some of my writing on the ethics of the lawyers who had become involved in advising the company on that document retention policy, which, of course, uh, the title was a misnomer. 
um, Mather observes that as damaging evidence against the tobacco industry grew, the industry increasingly relied on lawyers. There came a time when the industry's research documents were all being funneled through their lawyers to attract um, solicitor client privilege. So there's some introductory comments. Um, I'll now move on and uh, I'll proceed as follows. Um, I'll t first of all, I'll give just a brief explanation of class actions, what they are, especially for the non-lawyers in the room. Then I'll describe the three US waves of litigation. I'm going to then look at and analyze the debates as those waves of litigation were unfolding and afterwards about the efficacy of the litigation as a tobacco control strategy. I'll then briefly explain the Quebec class action litigation and consider it in the context of that previous uh, landscape that we've just, uh, we've just developed. Um, and time permitting, I'll make some preliminary general comments about the connections between the nature of a regulatory state, what kind of a regulatory state we're talking about because there are different types, and the role that litigation might or should play as a regulatory tool in that state. All right, so first of all, a little bit about class actions. This is just going to be sort of class actions 101. Um, most, of, most of us, I think all of us, are customers of a bank, okay? Um, imagine now that everyone in this room has had inappropriate or unjustified charges imposed by their banks. I mean, that could never happen, of course, but just <laughs> imagine that it might, might have happened. It's a, I'm really asking you to stretch your imaginations. So, and imagine that, um, you know, yours is $235, that's what it amounts to, and yours is 147 and yours is 23 and someone up here has a small company, so theirs is bigger, theirs is $3,470. Everyone in this room has uh, had those charges. Um, who among us will sue? Will the person with the $23 charge commence a proceeding against her bank or the person with the $147 charge? What about the person with the $3,000 charge? Or all of the other people in the community because if we in the room have this issue, then of course you know that in the broader community there are more people with the very same issue. The answer is no. Why wouldn't you? Because it is economically inefficient. The cost of litigation would far exceed the amount of any one of these claims. Unless you are fabulously wealthy and have a lot of time on your hands, you will not bother suing. You might just lump it, uh, take your lumps. Uh, yeah, they did it, that's banks. You might, or you might exit, as they say in the literature. Yeah, leave that bank and go to another one. There's various things you might do, but um, uh, it's very unlikely that you will sue. You might switch to some other type of dispute resolution. Um, but if we can all proceed in one action as a class of people with similar claims, things change. Why? Because now the group proceeding is much more economically viable. The damages to be received will indeed be much greater than uh, the cost of litigation. Thus, there is an incentive for lawyers to assume the risk. And one of the things uh, that sometimes I think is lost about class actions, very often we hear about the greedy lawyers who are getting a huge amount of money, and sometimes that happens. But if you look at how class action regimes have developed in jurisdictions from start to growth, if it weren't for risk-taking lawyers um, taking a chance and growing the legislation and growing the regime, um, it, it would not be nearly as effective as it is. Now, depending on which side of the class action you're on, you might think that's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, so just a few uh, 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 characteristics of the typical common law class action. I'm generalizing a bit here just to give you the picture. First of all, there has to be a class with similar claims. For example, all those bank customers who between this date and this date had penalty charges levied when those charges were not permitted by law to be levied or something like that. You have to define your class. Um, and that is a vital early step in a class action. Then you need to have a representative lead plaintiff even though there might be 20,000 people in the class, the case will appear, for example, if I'm the lead plaintiff as Cameron versus the ex-bank of whatever. Um, in most common law jurisdictions, but not all, the case has to be certified, which means at some early stage, after you've taken some preliminary steps, the court basically gives its approval, its imprimatur, that this case can proceed as a class action. Then assuming it is certified, it will either settle or go to trial. Uh, note that in civil litigation, most cases settle, but as we will see today, this is not so in tobacco litigation. 
And in the tobacco litigation story as it unfolded in the US, the tobacco industry had a strictly no settlement policy. In most jurisdictions, certification has become a hard-fought hard battleground because the concern of defendants is that once certified, the chances of success then increase considerably. So certification really has become uh, a battleground. One other issue is the class action regime in question opt-in or opt-out. In most common law jurisdictions, it is opt-out. What does this mean? That once the class is defined, you are in it if you have suffered the loss described in the claim, just by virtue of the fact that you have suffered that loss. Um, you would have to take the explicit step of opting out not to be in that class. Using our banking example, if we define a class amongst ourselves and we commence proceedings, and in the next room there are a group of people who have suffered similar losses, they are in the class. And what's the rationale for that? It's access to justice and its efficiency and it's also deterrence. Um, and just as an interesting aside, when I've taught classes that have a combination of students from common law and civil law jurisdictions, and I say to them, imagine that you're designing a class action regime for a particular country, should it be opt-in or opt-out? Um, most of the time, the students from civil law countries say it must be opt-in. They, they're focusing on an individual autonomy approach, whereas in the common law class action uh, regimes, we've given more weight to access to justice and deterrence and trying to collect as many as we can in the particular class action. <laughs> there are plenty of other provisions, um, for example, about notice um, and so on. Um, and that notice has been controversial because, at least in the early days, the notice requirements that courts were imposing on parties um, were in the hundreds of thousands or even millions of dollars, uh, which would, of course, make the regime um, uh, less, less accessible. And one final feature, all members of the class are bound by the judgment unless they have opted out. So that gives you a very brief uh, description of what a class action is in, in the common law systems. Okay, um, why have such mechanisms? Well, one is efficiency. Better to have one proceeding with one judge than to try similar claims with, in dozens of courts with dozens of different judges. Um, another is access to justice. I've mentioned that. Um, all of our little claims, you know, the $23 claim or the $2,000 claim, um, they wouldn't be pursued individually, but now that um, uh, we have grouped together, we can pursue them. Um, and so that vindicates even those small claims. Um, it might not be significant to the person with a $23 claim, but more so for the person with a $5,000 claim or a $10,000 claim. Then the other more controversial one is deterrence and behavior modification. Now, in our bank action that I've um, opined about here, we want to get the banks to stop levying inappropriate charges. Uh, get this company to stop misstating things in its prospectus. Get this automobile manufacturer to stop installing faulty airbags, and so on. Um, this might be the most controversial of the various justifications offered because some find it hard to see a causal connection. Uh, if we look at the legislative and law reform comments and work that preceded the introduction of class action legislation or rules across common law jurisdictions, the deterrence and behavior modification aims are identified more often than not as a rationale. But in some jurisdictions, they have explicitly decided not to, right? Because they thought it would be more politically acceptable um, if they um, uh, leave that aside. And again, that has to do with this regulation, litigation uh, yeah, divide and the proper role that people think courts have and how far you might be willing to concede that a court can actually, through litigation, have a regulatory role. In Australia, for example, with a, um, a class action regime that those of you who, who have looked at Canadian regimes would recognize, many similar features, in the legislative debates that led up to um, the enactment of the class action regime, there seemed to be um, uh, a, a clear intent to avoid saying those words, deterrence and behavior modification. But of course, after the fact, everyone concedes that they do have this behavior, uh, uh, deterrence and behavior modification role. Okay, so that's class actions. Um, it gives you a sense of, uh, um, what they look like. 
Let's now look at the three waves of U.S. litigation. And these are, as I said, the, a very early but a very substantial chapter in the tobacco litigation story. And it certainly is a story. Some have even suggested it's a morality tale. Um, I don't know if that's so or not, but I can see why they might suggest it. So let's look at the first wave. It happened in the 1950s. Information was slowly coming to light suggesting that smoking might be dangerous. That was the 1950s. The tobacco industry put a robust public relations approach in place to counter this potentially damaging information. Individual tort lawsuits began, and generally these were not successful. And by that I mean plaintiffs lost and the tobacco industry defendants won. In this first wave of tobacco litigation, we had not yet had the advantage of whistleblower revelations, Surgeon General reports, and evidence of industry cover-ups. That came later. The industry was able to succeed primarily by arguing that there was no scientific proof that smoking caused cancer. It is an understatement to describe the tobacco industry as a formidable litigation opponent. Various metaphors have been used. I referred to some of them earlier, deep pockets, scorched earth, and so on. Putting aside for a moment the disdain one might have for their tactics, it is hard not to marvel at their effectiveness in litigation, especially in these first waves of litigation and they were able to export the machinery they had developed to fight cases to other jurisdictions. In Australia, for example, one could see unfolding in some of the litigation there that I've mentioned, the tactics that had been used and perfected in earlier U.S. tobacco litigation. Um, they were at the time the quintessential repeat player, to use Galanter's descriptor. Um, Galanter uh, wrote an article called Why the Haves Come Out Ahead, and he looked at, resource, among other things, resource imbalances that can exist in litigation, money, experience, expertise, and so on, and how it affects outcomes. Um, there are a few famous quotes from the, these early waves of U.S. tobacco litigation that describe the tobacco industry's um, uh, philosophy. One is, um, a case is never lost if it is not tried. That was one approach they took. And so what does that mean? Um, you know, d basically drag it out as long as you can. And by the way, our system and our civil procedure rules do make it possible to do just that. Um, if you delay, 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 that means money, money, money. And if you've got deep pockets, that works for you. Another famous quote uh, was this, and I'm quoting exactly here, um, which is my way of saying, excuse the language, it's not mine, it's in a direct quote. Um, this is, was a tobacco company uh, executive. To paraphrase General Patton, the way we won these cases was not, was not by spending all of our money, but by making the other son of a bitch spend all of his. That was uh, one of their approaches. In this first wave of tobacco litigation cases in the US, the economic stakes were high for tobacco companies. Theirs was reportedly, at that time, a $50 billion per year industry. They had seen what happened in the asbestos industry. And if any of you have looked at or know about the asbestos litigation that unfolded, uh, in the U.S. One of the things that happened there is that eventually the asbestos companies started to settle individual suits and eventually they became bankrupt. And so the tobacco industry was very aware of what had happened and did not want the same thing to happen in tobacco litigation. Hence their um, one reason why they wouldn't settle. So that was the first wave uh, in which the tobacco company basically um, won uh, all of its cases. Then we have the second wave which came in the 1980s. Now, a lot had happened between, say, 1960 and 1980 to change the game a little bit. Uh, between the end of the first wave and the beginning of the second wave, there had been a great deal of asbestos litigation, as I just mentioned. Um, that's another big story for another time. For now, we can note that a much more experienced plaintiff tort bar now existed. Okay. Back to my comment about repeat players, one of the things that makes you a repeat player in litigation, uh, it's resources, and one of those resources is expertise, right? How good are, are you at this? And one thing that came out of the asbestos litigation was that um, a mass injury um, private tort bar lawyers developed so that they were able then to transfer some of that learning and that expertise in this second wave <coughs> of um, uh, tobacco litigation to the tobacco cases. Um, so there was that. Uh, furthermore, there was also now more evidence, including a Surgeon General's report, of a link between smoking and cancer. 
But notwithstanding this, the industry still prevailed in the litigation. They were still able to succeed, first of all, by prolonging things procedurally and on individual causation issues. In other words, you know, calling, we were still dealing mostly with individual tort cases and requiring each individual to prove that the reason they had this illness was because of the cigarettes and it was still hard to do. And their narrative was to blame the victim. Um, that's what they did and it worked. And by the way, juries did too, okay, because these trials were jury trials and juries were still not um, inclined to do anything other than say, if you're stupid enough to smoke, then you know, you get what you deserve. Um, Richard Daynard, a leading US tobacco control advocate, made this comment about juries in this second wave of US litigation. In his view, jurors need to be convinced to relax their impulse to blame the victims of tobacco-induced disease. A dominant notion, even among smokers, is that anyone stupid enough to smoke deserves what he gets. Ignored in this reasoning is that most smokers became addicted as teenagers and that most have tried unsuccessfully to quit. Um, and um, for those of you who are familiar with some of the tobacco regulation industries that governments and advocates have dealt with, a big one is trying to control advertising directed at young people. I don't know if some of you in the room might be old enough to remember Joe Camel, a cartoon character that was used to advertise cigarettes. And some research was, was done uh, indicating that a very high percentage of kids actually were quite familiar with the cartoon character, which of course was, was the aim. But it, certainly one of, the, one of the strategies of the tobacco industry was to advertise to and appeal to young people and um, to get them started young. Daynard, back to the quote I just uh, made, Daynard also speculated, somewhat presciently I think, that increasing public awareness of the addictiveness of tobacco use can be expected to reduce the prejudice against smokers. And as the narrative shifted in that direction, that is what happened. Um, he, and he said, detailed evidence of unsavory tobacco industry behavior may redirect some public animosity towards the industry. He was right on these counts. That is exactly what happened. And things were probably already in transition in 1988 by the end of the second wave when he made those comments. The secondhand smoke cases also had this effect. They were starting around this time and they were shifting the narrative of blame. Um, the first one, be, I think, being a case brought by flight attendants. Um, the narrative switched from you are hurting yourself and you're responsible for that to you are hurting me. So you, as the narrative switched um, in these ways, uh, it, it, uh, it made things harder for the tobacco industry. So as I said before, the tobacco industry had watched very closely what happened with asbestos litigation. The asbestos industry had opted for the settlement route to avoid uh, litigation, which also led to an avalanche of individual suits, which led to bankruptcy. Um, this prob probably steeled the resolve of the tobacco industry to fight all individual suits and not to settle any individual claims. There was one um, uh, success, one individual case uh, in um, uh, the second wave. It was the Cipollone case. And I'm going to just read you one excerpt. It's just, she says it uh, better than I can. This is from Lynn Mather's article. Um, just to give you a sense. So she says, between the 1950s and 1995, smokers and the families of deceased smokers filed more than 700 product liability lawsuits against the tobacco industry for the damages caused by smoking. But in only one lawsuit, Cipollone versus Ligit Group, did a jury in 1988 rule for the plaintiff and award damages. That verdict was then overturned by the Third Circuit Court of Appeals. After defeat at the Third Circuit level, the Cipollone family then appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court. The Supreme Court, in a complex and splintered ruling, reversed the Third Circuit decision and remanded the case, sent it back uh, to the trial level. At that point, however, neither the family nor the law firm could afford to continue the litigation. Thus, the tobacco industry had um, preserved its long-time boast of never paying a dime to any smoker who sued it. The Cipollone lawyer, Mark Edel, was experienced with asbestos litigation and had the support of other plaintiff lawyers as part of an anti-smoking litigation group, but they were totally outmatched in the case. 
the Cipollone lawsuit involved more than 100 motions. Now, that's amazing if you think of, so what a motion is is some contested issue that arises, you know, a trial within a trial in a sense. Um, and that's contested, that takes time, that takes preparation, and of course it costs money. Imagine 100, that is massive. Just ka-ching, ka-ching, I mean the money that this would cost is quite something. Um, 100 motions, most of which were argued, i.e. contested, several key pre-trial appeals, a four-month jury trial, two petitions for certiorari to the Supreme Court, uh, one of which was granted with argument and then uh, re-argument before the court again. Um, the estimated total plaintiff expenses, including out-of-pocket attorney and paralegal time in trial and appeals, uh, were three million. It would be a lot more now for that same time. Uh, in contrast, the defense, the tobacco industry, spent more than 25 times that figure. The three largest cigarette manufacturers spent at least 75 million on their defense of one case, Cipollone. Um, with figures like these for a suit against tobacco that gain not a cent for the plaintiffs, it is not hard to see why legal experts such as Rabin and Schwartz would disparage the possibility of tort law as a vehicle for policy change. Um, I'm not as cynical as uh, those people he's just referred to, but uh, you can see what the, uh, right, what the challenges are. So that, that's a good example. So that was the only, out of those roughly, uh, 700 cases, that was the successful one. And in that, um, if they'd had the resources to continue, there was a chance that they could at the state level have brought successful um, litigation. It might have been the chink in the armor or the foot in the door, but they just didn't have the resources uh, to continue. Okay, so that really gets us then to the end of the second wave. Wave three. The third wave was different from the first two. It included individual claims, but it also included class action and state claims to recover Medicaid costs related to state expenses incurred in dealing with the negative health effects of smoking. These state claims were a new component not present in the first two waves. There was also, and by the way, I think they were one of, the, that's, that was probably the turning point in this story, those state claims. There was also a lot more inf information available now, some of it from whistleblowers. I don't know if anyone has seen The Insider with um, uh, Russell Crowe, but that's based on Dr. Jeffrey Wigand, who worked as research director for one of the three large industries, and he, uh, he became a whistleblower. Um, and, uh, and in fact gave evidence in, uh, might have given evidence in the Quebec case, I'm not sure, but he, he became a witness in some of the uh, tobacco litigation. Um, and in addition to what we got from whistleblowers, because of all that litigation that had been happening, although it had not been successful, uh, a lot of information had re been revealed in the discovery process in that litigation. So in civil litigation there is a process called discovery where parties have to exchange documents and as the documents were ordered to be uh, disclosed by um, uh, judges and became public, we learned more and more about what the tobacco companies had been up to, uh, collusion, um, uh, and so on. The causation and contributory negligence arguments used by the industry in the earlier waves of cases brought by individuals were irrelevant in cases in which the states were plaintiffs. That's one of the reasons why I say I think that state uh, litigation was a turning point. These state Medicaid cases were based on epidemiological evidence, not on the conduct of any individual smoker. Um, remember that in the earlier ways, the cases were primarily individual tort claims brought by single plaintiffs. But Alderman and Daynard observed that the state attorneys general had some financing from their states and contingency fee support from private attorneys. And unlike individuals, the states were fault-free plaintiffs against which the industry could not employ assumption of risk or contributory negligence defenses. Um, the state-initiated litigation ended in the master settlement agreement, with all states eventually signing agreements with the industry. The industry agreed to pay about $240 billion and to make certain other concessions regarding things like advertising and promotion. Um, and depending on who you talk to, that was successful or not. Um, some of some tobacco control public health people in the um, t tobacco space um, 
think that, in fact, they should have done better. They should have got more strict terms in the Master Settlement Agreement. Um, others look at it and say, we got something, we got a lot more than we ever got before, and we, got, we finally got the tobacco industry to um, basically concede defeat and settle. So um, it depends on, on your view here. I happen to think that it really was a turning point and something did come from it. There were some specific regulatory changes that happened, quite apart from the more implicit advantages uh, in a regulatory sense from, you know, the revealing of the information and so on in, in the litigation. So the tobacco industry's strategy had been never to settle and to fight every case, but this time they had settled and they'd, they'd paid a lot of money. Um, I did note one parallel here, uh, something uh, that's been happening in the climate change space. I'm certainly not a, a climate change expert by any means, but I, this did catch my eye. Some litigation going on uh, in New York under legislation called the Morgan Act um, against Exxon Mobil, um, and it is um, a bit of a switch in the usual approach to litigation. Um, the investigation differentiates itself from previous climate change litigation by attempting to hold companies responsible for their contributions to climate change using laws unrelated to climate change. I thought that was interesting because, again, we see the narrative switching, right? Yeah, taking a different tack, having a different theory of the case. What's the theory of the case in this New York litigation? The failure of these companies to disclose risks related to climate change in their Security and Exchange Commission disclosure. So going in a completely different direction, sort of like getting Al Capone for tax evasion rather than any of the other things that, that he was known to have done. So I thought that was an interesting parallel. Um, if you're thinking of using litigation effectively as an advocate to really bring about change, think about what, you know, first of all, what kind of litigation you're doing, but secondly, what's the theory of your case and, you know, what's the most effective way to, um, um, to bring about some change. Um, so the, mas the master settlement agreement was a success when considered in the light of the failure of previous tobacco litigation. But amongst public health advocates and experts, there are mixed views about its efficacy, as I said previously. And there are many who see the MSA in regulatory terms as a failure. The money paid was less than earlier draft agreements had required. It was still a lot, $240 billion. But there had been some earlier discussions, which had the tobacco industry paying something in the $350 billion range. So people saw that as um, a failure. Um, the, so the money paid was less uh, than had previously been uh, suggested, and the concessions obtained from the industry were also thought by some to be much weaker than required for real public health benefits. Furthermore, as time went on after the Master Settlement Agreement, it appeared that the money obtained by the states in the settlement was being used for various reasons, not all of which had to do with yeah, tobacco um, uh, control. And one example was that one of the states tried to commoditize the value of its uh, master settlement agreement contribution to pay off some debts that had nothing to do with right, tobacco control. So that's, that's too bad. Um, uh, but, but there were some states that did actually use the money for various tobacco control related public health issues. Um, while state litigation to recover Medicaid costs and the master settlement agreement were the main event in the third wave of litigation, there were also a number of individual and class action cases, in some of which the plaintiffs were successful, but most of which were overturned on appeal. Litigation successes and failures are one thing, uh, here I mean the actual outcomes of cases, but there might also be success in the sense of achieving some positive policy health outcomes with litigation, independent of the actual outcome of a case. Daynard observed in 1988 that a major defect in the use of litigation as a cancer control strategy was that the tobacco industry was winning all of its cases. In his view, litigation would become an effective strategy once the plaintiffs had recorded a few wins. Um, Mather takes a similar approach, I think, in her article theorizing about trial courts, lawyers, policy making, and tobacco litigation. She analyzes the efficacy of litigation, but she focuses on the entire process and not just on outcome, right? And I, I find this quite useful because a lot of the critics of the value of litigation 
um, as a tobacco control um, strategy look at, are looking at appellate outcomes, right? They're going to what the Supreme Court said or what the appellate court said and saying, well, it's a, it's a loss, so therefore it's not useful. Um, Mather takes a much more holistic, organic approach to things. Uh, she analyzes the uh, efficacy of litigation by focusing on the entire process. She suggests that lawyers, judges, unions, because unions got involved also in litigation to try to recruit their costs, uh, state attorneys general, individual plaintiffs, and many positive trial court decisions had an effective policy-making role. And in her view, to understand how policy-making about tobacco became so conflictual from 94 to 98, that's when the states were, were um, uh, bringing their litigation and you know, led up to the master settlement agreement, and why the industry offered to settle cases and submit to government regulation, we need to look at trial lawyers, jury verdicts, and judge decisions, topics that were virtually ignored in political science and in the analyses that were happening in this space um, in previous decades. So Mather endorses an approach that instead of focusing on appellate outcomes and instead of focusing only on Supreme Court decisions, focuses instead on processes and the various actors in these processes and on the ways laws and judicial decisions can build social movements compel policy changes and develop legal consciousness. So she calls hers a bottom-up and inside-out approach rather than a top-down and outside-in approach. She says, to explain how litigation and trial courts have affected tobacco policy, I rely on a broad definition of policymaking as including a series of different stages from problem definition and agenda setting to rule establishment to implementa implementation rather than only seeing policies as made at the point of rule and actment. She argues that while the Cipollone case, the one I told you about that went all the way to the Supreme Court, was remanded back, but uh, by then they'd run out of money, the plaintiffs had run out of money. The Cipollone plaintiff lawyers had to give up because they had, so, they had no money left. The opening created by the Supreme Court of the United States in their judgment, and there was an opening there that made the possibility of state success at the state level uh, a live one, um, uh, might just have been what was needed to send a message to the plaintiff bar that there is a risk here worth taking. And I want to stop there again, I said this earlier, but we can't underestimate the contribution that risk-taking lawyers have played here, okay? Eventually what happened, I think, the tobacco industry was able to shift the narrative again sometime in the late 80s to greedy lawyers, and once they did that I think the, the landscape changed a bit. But if, if you look at uh, what some of these lawyers did to make it possible to bring cases, uh, you have to, um, I think, you have to admire them. And in fact, going back to the Australia um, legislation, I was there uh, living and working and teaching in Australia and doing research on these issues when the legislation was fairly new. And so I got to watch it develop. And the real reason it developed well is because there were one or two gutsy plaintiff lawyers who put it all on the line and what they put up with in order to have that first or that second success was really quite something um, um, remarkable, including extreme personal financial risk. But it grew the, it grew the uh, uh, legislation and finally got it to the point where it was able to achieve some of its intended aims. Like class actions or not, they exist for a purpose. Um, uh, and you know, risk-taking lawyers um, in situations like this, where a lot of courage and risk are ne risk-taking are needed, um, really do make a difference uh, for the good. And um, I say here, enter the entrepreneurial lawyer. Some people think entrepreneurial is a dirty word, but in this context, in the context I'm um, uh, using it, I don't think it is. Um, all right. Um, Let's see. So let's talk about the impacts of the three waves. I've just got about five more minutes here, and then we're going to uh, open it up. Um, again, I'm going to adopt Lynn Mather's analysis, her bottom-up, inside-out approach. She summarizes the impact of tobacco litigation, and especially the third wave, as having both constituted and caused change in tobacco policymaking. 
Um, in her words, the litigation and rulings redefined the tobacco problem. So problem definition, switching the narrative, is essential. Named it as worthy of legal attention, i.e. You know, to appeal to some risk-taking lawyers. Created new players. Um, attorneys general, right, because of the state litigation. We now had attorneys general who come with resources and power. Um, and private lawyers and conglomerates of trial lawyers, because one of the ways the uh, trial lawyers in the US were able to actually take some of these cases was to basically um, form teams, get over their usual competitive uh, uh, inclinations with one another to form teams and actually pool resources. And so that, uh, in, in a sense, back to Galanter's repeat player, it made them a bit of a repeat player, whereas an individual lawyer might not have been. Um, so I wouldn't do all of that. Um, just a few of the things that come out of this wave. Disclosure of damaging information. Even in the unsuccessful litigation, lots of information was disclosed that told us about uh, the uh, industry and what it had been up to. Lots of media attention, which was increasingly adverse. Reframing of the narrative. I've told you about that, how the narrative was reframed from, from traditional in, uh, individualized tort litigation principles of responsibility, assumption of risk, contributory negligence, to the language of fraud, deceit, and addictive, uh, addiction. Um, now, there are others who present a less optimistic picture than, than Mather, who say, OK, litigation has a role, but it's complementary. It's not quite as central as Mather says. OK, so just um, I'll, I'll say a few words about the Quebec class action. Um, and by the way, I should say, for those of you who don't know, we've got going on in Canada now that same um, state attorney general litigation. Every province, I think every province now in Canada has a claim uh, to recover health care <coughs> costs related to tobacco. I'm surprised it's not getting more attention. I was chatting recently with um, um, a former politician who had an active role in federal uh, tobacco legislation and bringing it about and so on in the 90s. And he was making a similar comment and saying um, they should really be pushing this. And I suppose if they were thinking that this really is an effective way to bring about uh, change, they might be. So it's not getting much attention. Started in BC um, with the Health Care Costs Recovery Act. The tobacco industry challenged it, went all the way to the Supreme Court, Supreme Court upheld it, and then other provinces followed suit. So now we've got basically a nationwide uh, yeah, uh, litigation similar to those American Medicaid cases. But now we've also got in Quebec two class actions, okay? Um, one brought by a group of people who actually are suffering from cancer and other smoking-related illnesses, and one brought by people who, although not suffering from illnesses, are addicted. Um, that's the two classes that have been defined. Um, the plaintiff's claims state that tobacco manufacturers fail to warn consumers about the dangers of their products to consumers' health and that they implement policies to publicly deny the harmful effects, that they deliberately manipulated their products to maintain addiction, and that they were very much involved in generating scientific controversy and spreading misinformation. The actions commenced in 1998 and were authorized, certified in 2005. So it took six, seven, seven years, never good at math, seven years just to get to certification. Over 16 years of proceedings and 253 days of hearings, 76 witnesses took the stand and over 30,000 documents were tabled as evidence. Fact witnesses included current and past tobacco company executives, federal public servants, a former federal minister of health. There were eight expert witnesses for the plaintiffs and 16 for the defendants. Justice Reordan and his predecessors rendered more than 100, there's that magic number again, 100 interlocutory judgments. Okay? You can see why it would take 16 years with 100 uh, contested uh, motions. Uh, and more than 40 of those were appealed by the defendants, none successfully. Um, it sounds like the tobacco, the US tobacco story. Um, the decision was released in May 27, 2015, in favor of the plaintiffs. In a 276-page judgment, Justice Brian Reordan of the Quebec Superior Court uh, found the tobacco companies liable. He made an order for damages in the amount of $15 billion. 
All three tobacco companies have appealed. The decision was heard in, at, at the end of 2016, so it will be very interesting to see what happens with that one. One final special feature of the <laughs> Quebec class action regime, which is shared by Ontario but no other Canadian jurisdictions, there is a public fund that you can apply to to get support for your class action. Uh, it's called the FONDS, F-O-N-D-S, or the fund. Um, and um, if you are successful, then what does that do? That really removes a lot of the risk, right? Because without that, who's funding the class action? Basically, the lawyer is funding the class action. The lawyer is taking all the risk. Usually, it's done on a contingency fee basis, which means, OK, if you win, you get a nice payoff. If you lose, you get nothing, right? And plus, you've incurred a lot of expenses in time and other ways. Um, so if the fund accepts a request for funding, it can pay lawyer fees, expert fee fees, um, advertising in the newspapers to give notice, that's a big part of it, court costs and other expenses necessary. Okay? So uh, Ontario has that as well. In Australia, when the, um, the law reform document was done recommending a class action regime, they also recommended that the only way it could really be successful and achieve its purposes <laughs> is if it had that sort of public fund attached to it. But that was not one of the outcomes. The, the, uh, the legislation was enacted, but no such fund was um, uh, there. OK, so I'm just going to look through my notes here. I'm not going to tell you any more about the Quebec um, class actions. I'll just make one concluding comment, and then that's it. Um, at the outset, I said I would make some preliminary general comments, time permitting, about the connections between the nature of a regulatory state uh, and the role that litigation might or should play as a regulatory tool. I think uh, I, I refer here to some of the work of Maria Glover, um, who has um, uh, said that private regulation through litigation is integral to the structure of the modern administrative state. Private litigation and the mechanisms that enable it are not merely add-ons to our regulatory regime, much less are they fundamentally at odds with it. Uh, so in this way, she's closer to the view of Mather and probably would think uh, that some of the other critiques have uh, um, uh, misunderstood things. Um, now, one of the questions is, though, what kind of an administrative state do you have? And one of the arguments Glover is making is that the tendency in the U.S. is to do ex post as opposed to ex ante regulation, okay, to basically prefer regulation after something bad happens as opposed to focus on regulation to keep something bad from happening. Um, and hence, in Glover's theory, that this is why um, private attorneys general, which has a, is the name given to some private lawyers who take on some of this litigation, why there's such a space created for them, because in a sense, um, there is a gap because of ineffective regulation. You might buy that theory or not, um, uh, but that's her view. Um, now, just uh, a comment from Justice um, uh, Berger, I think. As Chief Justice Berger recognized, the aggregation of individual claims, he's talking now about uh, class actions, in the context of a class-wide suit is e an evolutionary response to the existence of injuries unremedied by the regulatory action of government. Um, now, that's written in an American context. Right? So one of the questions I would ask as a Canadian is what kind of a regulatory state do we have? And um, if I were then to ask and answer that question, I would do my analysis of the role of litigation under that umbrella. And I think the analysis would be a little bit different. One of the things I thought about as I was uh, preparing for this presentation is what has happened in Canada um, from a... Um, uh, from a legislative and regulatory perspective, let's say over the past 25 years, um, um, and, and what does it tell me about w whether we are better, at least in the tobacco regulation space, at ex ante, before the fact regulation, as opposed to afterwards? Um, and my conclusion is that, that we are actually. Um, and in fact, just in the past, um, in the past couple of months, so I'd be interested to talk to anyone in the room who knows about this, uh, Health Canada has put out a consultation document seizing the opportunity, the future of tobacco control in Canada. The last time they did this was in 2012. Uh, and as I read this document, I, and think about it in the context of Glover's regulatory state comments, 
um, I am led to conclude, although it's tentative at this point, I need to think about it uh, a bit more, that we're, we are actually doing a better job in the ex-ante stage of thinking about how effectively to regulate tobacco control and that that would then, I think, have an analysis on the role we think litigation should uh, play. Um, so I think that's enough. I'll stop there. And I guess I've left you with a question, but that's okay. So I'm happy to um, uh, take any uh, comments or questions. Great. We have lots of time. Professor Kaiser. I wonder if you think there's any template for best practices for legislatures to either facilitate the settlement of, of uh, litigation or to obviate litigation. Is, is there any kind of composite picture you, you would recommend if you were engaged today to say, what can we do to make this happen? I guess there's a couple. I think maybe there's two questions there. Uh, and I think I'll sort of take the second one first. Um, one thing I'd like to do is actually make litigation itself more effective, right? If, you know, should these cases take 16 or 17 years from beginning to end? I don't think they should. Um, uh, regardless of uh, the place we think they occupy, we're probably all going to conclude, or many of us, that they do occupy some place in our, in our system for, for various reasons, uh, not all of which would have regulatory purposes. And so that's one part of it. I would try to um, think about that. And um, one of the difficulties, of course, is goes to the heart of what our advers adversarial system is and how it works and how it doesn't work. That's one problem. Related to that, I think, is the role of judges, which um, even though we've gotten better at the concept of a judge's case manager, I think we've got a long way to go. So that's the second part of your question, and it's how to make uh, I'm not, oh, I'm supposed to be over here, aren't I? They told me not to wander too far. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, and I said, I, I promise I won't, and there I did it on the first question, uh, is how to make litigation more effective. And then I don't have, I have less of an insight um, into the first part of your question, and I think, if I've understood correctly, that it goes to the comment I was making about what's the, what's the nature of our regulatory state. Um, and... Um, it was interesting, I've done a read, I, I haven't done a word search, but in this document I just mentioned, the word litigation isn't mentioned once in it, right? The government document, the, you know, seizing the opportunity, uh, um, the next sort of five-year plan, and they use language in here like calls to action and so on. Um, and so uh, I think it would probably be um, uh, the kind of ex-ante, before-the-fact regulation that's reflected in this document, all right, I think that's good. Um, and advocacy, the, the role of advocacy groups in um, taking these issues seriously and, and feeding into them. So that's some of the, uh, I don't know if that answers your question. But well, I, I didn't expect there would be a perfect answer yeah. because you know, BC would have chosen it or Quebec would have yeah. chosen it. Yeah. yeah, I mean, what BC, so what BC and then all the other provinces are doing, they, they figured out, they saw the Medicaid state attorneys general uh, litigation in the US and figured out that this was a pretty good idea, and I think, I think it is. Um, so this is why I like Mather's analysis, because Mather, uh, some people say litigation is a complementary tool, right? Whatever word you use. But what I like about Mather's analysis is that she understands that it's not just one thing, right? Um, it's uh, litigation, it's regulation, it's advocacy. Um. Yes? And so kind of builds off that last question. I, you mentioned at several points um, the idea or the role played by whistleblowers. And um, I was thinking a lot about pieces of legislation that, to my knowledge, we don't have in Canada, like the False Claims Act in the United States, that not only goes some way to protecting whistleblowers, but rewards them for so doing in a financial <coughs> sense. So, and that's conceived in the regulatory theory literature as a public-private regulatory tool, right? You sort of have these private whistleblowers that assist the state in prosecuting deception of the government and the people. 
turn. And so I wondered if you have any reflections on whether those kinds of legal tools might be useful mm -hmm. in a context like Canada. You may be less so in, in tobacco, where we sort of already know a lot about the harms, but you know, uh, an area that's near and dear to my heart around pharmaceuticals, where what's actually going on, the people with the knowledge, um, encouraging them to come forward isn't easy. So yeah. do you have any reflections on those kinds of legal tools as, as part of this broader sort of set of tools for regulation at large? Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, if, if you look at, if you read a little bit about the life of Jeffrey Wigand, who was the director of research with, I think it was Brown and Williamson, um, uh, doing what he did was not, a, he, I mean, it, it had a real impact on his personal life and his professional life. Um, so the more protection you can give for people in that role, the better. Um, I'm not sure if the American legislation you've referred to was in place when he uh, came forward. Um, uh, you know, he lost his job, he based his, his personal life fell apart, um, he was bankrupt, you know, it's, 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 it's hard. So anything, um, anything to encourage whistleblowers to come forward um, is vital. And it is because, um, look at the impact. One of the biggest uh, positive developments in this morality tale, this tobacco story, is the revealing of information, right? Through discovery and through whistleblowers. And so um, that really, that and the master settlement agreement were, in my view, the things that really did shift things and, and adjust, readjust the balance of power. Um, and so that indicates that protection for whistleblowers, that is a very good legislative strategy, would be to make sure that that exists. Again, back to the point, it's not just one thing, right? Yep. Yep. Uh, thank you. I found that very interesting and I appreciated it. Um, I wondered about the fund that you mentioned that you can apply to in Ontario and Quebec. And uh, I would be interested in your further comments on it. Obviously, it has made class actions um, more amenable in those two provinces. And now I understand why so many came out of Quebec or have come out of Quebec uh, more generally than tobacco. But I'd be interested in your comments on whether, for instance, every province should have this. Are we able to? Um, um, ride off of the presence of the funds in Ontario, in Ontario and Quebec, or should we, in Nova Scotia, for instance, have our own to encourage class action? Mm. Um, I lean toward yes in answer to that question. And I go back to, again, looking at some of the law reform work that was done leading up to many of these class action um, uh, regimes and systems and the number of times that the recommendation was made that to really make this efficacious, you need to have one of these, uh, you need to have this public support. Um, and I think you do, because uh, one of the things we learn from the US tobacco litigation story is just how hard it is when you don't, right? Um, so uh, one way to make it affordable, and this is what Ontario does, is that in exchange for getting the benefit of it, you agree to give a percentage of any outcome back to the fund, right? So you can grow the fund that way. So it's not um, entirely state supported. So I would also support that kind of a, um, um, a provision. Um, what, what, one of the things that has grown up in Australia, some of you will know about this, um, uh, but it's third party litigation funding where companies who are in the business of funding litigation for profit step in and that's what's happened in Australia. So in Australia lawyers aren't allowed to charge contingency fees. It's a cost shifting jurisdiction which means loser pays winner um, and there is no fund and so um, some very enterprising um, people formed companies to um, uh, basically fund litigation. So in a sense, the Australian equivalent of the fund are the private companies you go to and you apply and you say, will you fund this litigation? I don't like that model as much, although I think it's better than nothing because again, it means the difference sometimes between the cases being brought and not being brought. Um, and there are some of these private third party funders funding some cases in Canada now. Um, but less so because of the fact that lawyers can charge contingency fees and that we have in Quebec and Ontario um, the funds. But uh, long answer, short answer is I lean towards saying yes, 
some version of the fund, I think, is a good idea if you really want to uh, give these class action, this class action legislation feeling and scope. Yeah. My name is Logan Lawrence. I'm in the PhD health program. And I'm wondering, uh, you spoke about different waves through this whole process and how the, the litigators can kind of learn from successive waves. And I'm wondering if coming into new legislation around marijuana legalization, if you expect a oh, similar kind of terrain, you know, given that some of the differences that exist between you know, a long-standing tobacco industry that's very large that's very and you know, a very, you know, pardon the pun, budding industry uh, that doesn't have a whole lot of money or time around it, but also none of the epidemiological data to suggest you know, some of the public health harms that marijuana might pose compared to the long-standing data we have now on the harms of tobacco. So, so are you thinking, is, is it possible that we might find ourselves in a space where lawsuits against marijuana producers are being considered? Is that what you're thinking? Uh, among other things, I guess I'm also wondering if potentially since there is some resistance from the public health sphere around the legalization of marijuana, if they can borrow from some of the experience that previous public health advocates have gained from the tobacco sphere, uh, or it will be completely new territory. Uh, it won't be completely new territory. No, they, they can borrow because um, uh, you, you saw it happening from asbestos to tobacco, and then you see it happening from tobacco to gun control, right? If you look at these, you can see that one is building on the other and learning from the other. So there would be a lot to learn. Uh, what I haven't thought about, it's an interesting question, and I guess I just don't know enough yet about um, uh, the impacts of... Uh, uh, marijuana, um, what I haven't thought about is how that might play out in a litigation way, but that, I think, that's, we're a long way from that yet, aren't we? Yeah. Yeah. But, but yeah, there definitely is something to learn, no question about it. Yeah. 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 I guess the main learning, the main learning, um, the reason it was so important in tobacco litigation is we're talking about mass harm, right? Asbestos, uh, tobacco, gun control, these are situations of mass harm and so that's why I think one was useful as a learning tool for the other. So it depends on what the harms are uh, in the marijuana space. Yeah. Of course, government's not always on the side of the angels in terms of you know its position in relation to mass um, harm. So I think of the blood litigation in the past or residential schools, uh, which was a long time, you know, coming to the settlement and prison litigation now. So often, you know, government is on some hook. So I wonder to what extent that plays a role in the willingness of government, say, to you know, give these sorts of funds that we've been talking about, and what might make the difference between you know a government like Ontario that's open to that to encouraging uh, class actions through such a you know mechanism and one that mm. is going to balk because mm. that might actually end up more vulnerability as opposed to the story we're telling yeah. you know, encouraging government yeah. regulatory aims. We don't want to empower somebody to sue us. What? Yeah. <laughs> government's great at blocking litigation as well, as we know. Yeah. Um, so if I think about some of the work, some of the uh, discussion in the Quebec, uh, so much of this is political, right? And so much of this really does depend on uh, what's the political climate and who's in control at the time that this is being debated. And uh, that's been commented on in the Quebec situation. And also, if I think in, in Australia, there, I think there was a more conservative political climate then. And so not only did they not say no to the fund, but they even wouldn't acknowledge deterrence and behavior modification as, right? So, so much of it depends on that. Um, uh, it's a good question. The, the, the trick is to get it at the outset, right? As, as, the as the legislation is new, much harder to get it once the legislation has been in place for a while. Um, so I'm not sure, you know, I don't have a view about how you might how you might lobby them, um, and I think it would be, I'm not even sure, on my list of things that I would take on where I think I might have some chance of success, that would be <laughs> lower down the list because I, it's, I think it would be different. Yeah, 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 in a province that doesn't already have it, yeah. Somebody said to me recently, it was interesting, someone who's done some class action litigation about the Quebec um, class action um, uh, legislation, 
the, it seems the approach in Quebec is, on the, by the courts, justify to us why this shouldn't proceed as a class action rather than justify to us why it should, right? There's, so there's a very different approach. But it wasn't always the case. If, if, you look at, if you look at any jurisdiction that's taken on a class action, it's very unfamiliar, right? You're switching from a, one lawyer, one person to a whole amorphous group of people who aren't even before the court, and it's, it's unfamiliar. And so judges um, generally took a very conservative approach to interpreting it. Um, and that happened in Quebec too, but jurisprudentially in Quebec there was a switch and they, they took a much more liberal approach. Um, but back to your question, yeah, I, mean, I, don't, I don't have an easy answer for that one. And that would be really, if you took that on, um, law being the government to try to put that sort of fund in place, that would be a huge project. Okay, before I thank, oh, sorry, Dylan. Can I just have one question? I'm familiar with anything related to, to tobacco regulation and lawsuits in Europe, um, any of the European countries. A little bit. Um, so I, I did, rec I do some time ago recall uh, chatting with, there was some tobacco litigation going on in um, uh, the Netherlands, and I was chatting with some, <laughs> Uh, lawyers about it and found out that they do not have in, in litigation in that country our concept of discovery, so there was really no exchange of documents. And I thought to myself, how on earth do you even have a chance if you can't get documents? Now, in the tobacco, the good news is, is that in the tobacco litigation story, because it's international, uh, a lot of the documents are already out there anyway as a result of the litigation that happened in the States. Um, so there has been some. They're um, increasingly um, uh, European uh, countries are taking on some version of a class action, different from the, uh, the common law version, but they have it. Um, but there hasn't nearly been the amount of tobacco litigation there that there has been in um, uh, the U.S. And it might have something to do, I don't know, I'm guessing now, this idea of the nature of the regulatory state. I, I, I'm just guessing now, I'd have to look into this, but it might have something to do with the fact that perhaps they're better at uh, um, ex ante regulation, regulation, state regulation, I don't know. That's, that's possible. And yeah, it's, yeah, it's true. <laughs> and people who've compared the nature of regulatory states do observe that many European countries do more ex ante regulation, but, uh, but yeah, they do, yeah. They do smoke a lot more, and if looking at this document, for example, this Canadian document and the calls to action and the aims, um, uh, when they compare themselves to countries who set um, ambitious aims, the, there's only one European country in the list. It's Finland, um, and the rest are New Zealand, uh, you know, Australia, and so on. <coughs> okay, before I ask you to help me in thanking Dean Cameron for today's talk, I wanted to just thank all of you uh, for coming, as well as other members of the Health Law Institute, most notably Professor Sheila Wildman, for sort of curating this, this year's uh, set of speakers. But thank you in the audience. We have sort of, a, to use Galanter's term, a, a roster of repeat players, but also folks, a, a very diverse crowd who come in and come out, new folks coming to each seminar. And part of what really makes this seminar such a delight to attend is not just the speakers, but all of you who come and engage. So thank you very much for coming. We're looking forward to having a new seminar series uh, starting next September. Uh, we're working on putting together an interesting group of speakers for next year again. Uh, and after reminding you of that, I'd just like to ask you to join me in thanking Dean Cameron for reminding us of the power of litigation as much as its trade-offs are alive and well as well. Um, but I think she's given us a lot to think about um, in terms of sort of the broad view of regulation in different areas of health. So please join me in thanking Dean Cameron for today's lecture.